Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. So we are recording. Excellent. Hello, Amy. Thank you for doing this. Hi, Teddy. Uh, <laughs> Mr. DeWitt, I'm thrilled to be doing this. <laughs> just, all right, so class, just to give you an introduction, uh, this is Amy Resneski. She is the uh, Michael H. Jordan Professor of Management at the Yale School of Management. And she was uh, one of my most favorite professors when I was in uh, graduate school getting my MBA. And uh, I took a class with her called Careers, um, which was foundational and actually helping me be in front of you now. It's what helped me sort of realize what it is that I wanted to do. And, uh, and Amy Professor Rosneski played a big role in actually helping me to get there. And uh, she's also a Michigan alum. so. Uh, she was able to speak very much about her experience, and that's why I'm here. So thank you, Amy, for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me, and go blue. <laughs> go blue, indeed. Um, so I just have I just have some questions. I just want to you know just just talk to you and uh, you know just kind of you know get your uh, expertise here. So um, um, first thing is my students are not as familiar with your work as I am. So could you tell me a little bit about uh, two of the things that you are known for, uh, job crafting and the idea of a job versus a career versus a calling? Absolutely. So, um, and, and something that you didn't tell them in, in the oh. introduction is that, or that I didn't mention, is that if I was one of your favorite faculty members at Yale, um, you were perhaps my best ever TA. Oh. <laughs> uh, that I've ever had. And so this was the stars for a long time that you would be a faculty member someday and uh, a scholar in your own right. Um, <laughs> so I, um, I, my two sort of primary streams of research have been shaped by one question, uh, but they've taken two really different forms. So I'm really interested in how people make meaning of their work. I care about this a lot because work is something that takes up so much of our time. And for many people, they're identity, sort of its defining of life in many ways. And I've always been intrigued by the fact that you could look at one job, you know, one role in an organization, and you could find people who do that job and see it as a job where it's primarily about a means to an end. It's a way to support their themselves or their family um, versus someone else doing the same job who sees that work as a career where the work is about advancing within that job or occupation whether that means doing that in the same organization or having to move organizations to keep that progression going and all of the increases in prestige and power and so on that go with that um, versus people doing the same work as these first two people, but see, seeing that work really differently, not as a means to a financial end or to career advancement, but rather seeing the work that they're doing as an end in itself where if they hit the lottery or something, they would still want to stay involved in this work because they love the work, they identify with the work, they feel like the work is sort of core to the self. Um, and often people who see their work this way, what we call a calling orientation, um, see the work as making the world a better place in some way, they see the work as contributing um, in some way, even if, if you and I would look at the work and not necessarily see it as something that's making a societal contribution, the mm -hmm. thing that matters is that the people who are doing it do. So I've been really interested in this and I've studied this for a number of years to try to understand um, what it is that uh, leads people to see their work in each of these three ways, mm -hmm. why it matters, sort of how is it important to, for them for the outcomes they experience, and then also why would it matter to the organizations that they're part of. So that's the first stream. The second one is also has very much to do with meaning and work and looks instead at how do people essentially change the design of their jobs once they're in organizations and in jobs. Um, and I'm going to pause for just one second for <laughs> sure. And uh, so, but how, how people um, act upon the design of their jobs in ways that allow them to, let me, I'm going to start that part again. Okay. Um, the, the other sort of way in which I look at this is how people change the design of their jobs to change the tasks that are part of their jobs, the interactions and relationships that make up their workday, um, and how they think about kind of the cognitive whole of their job in ways that change how they experience the meaning of their work and how they experience their identity and work. Mm -hmm. So almost every job comes with a job description, something that the organization or a manager has asked us to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really intrigued by the ways in which people deviate from those behaviorally and also cognitively um, so that they can 
engender or create or protect a sense of meaning in that work that is that works for them that's positive for them whether or not it's positive for the organization um, and we see that happening in all kinds of jobs up and down the hierarchy of organizations in various sectors and industries and so on and that's process uh, that fascinates me a lot of sense and you know it's, it's funny you sort of started talking about this the, those those items and i was thinking about is there a way to you know is part is any part of the process of getting towards a calling actually crafting your way from a job or a career i think so i think it's a great question um and the the statement of the question makes me think of something that i think is really important and i you have probably heard me say to our students here. And that is, I think it's a trap to think of a calling as an entity that's out there in the world that's just waiting for you to discover it. Mm. And if you try enough jobs, or if you, you know, think hard enough, or if you do enough assessments, you'll figure out what that is. And then once if you can access that work, once you access it, you will skip happily through every mm. subsequent working day. Of your life, <laughs> right? Yes. I think that sets people up for major disappointment and anxiety, mm. frankly, because um, it, it precludes the possibility that you can either craft your way into or kind of almost maybe even bumble your way into work where you realize, wait a minute, this really feels important to me. This feels like this matters in the world in a way that I care about. Um, and I can make it even more so through, you know, these deviations that I'm making in the job or these yeah things I'm designing into the job, where over a period of time, as you get more and more practiced in that work, you realize this is something that you deeply care about, that attaches you, you know, to your community or to the universe in ways that matter to you. Um, and that is ultimately a lot more sustaining and satisfying for people in the long term mm. than a job that they, you know, have fun there, they kind of, you know, enjoy it, it's novel, um, but there's not that sort of deeper level stuff happening. So. All right. so that kind of, you know, going from there, that kind of view kind of really, really suggests that um, as you're starting to think about your career and a lot of my students are just sort of just starting that, that there's a certain amount of um, thinking about it deliberately that that helps sort of like taking stock of where you are in each each role rather than thinking there is this um, metaphorical yeah. ideal out there that you get closer as you try things and sometimes you're going to find something that's close and then you need to try to just you know think about how you're going to like uh, enlarge that right. role to be what you want right no exactly okay that makes exactly. A lot. yeah and that, so that kind of goes into the next question um because yeah. like one of the things i have my students do is they write this strategic careers paper and so they're using they're, they're doing what you, you know, kind of what you described. I have them try to think into their potential careers a bit and think about the things that they want to be doing, what's important to them, what kind of, um, what kind of jobs make sense, but also to think about how the external context, context is going to affect the industries that they're, that they're in. So yeah. I had them use things like industry analysis to try to understand what the pressures on a given field are going to be. Um, and then how things from the macro environment like political shocks or economic changes or sociocultural impacts will affect the structure. Um, and so uh, and part of that exercise uh, that I had them do along with that is to um, do a, uh, a visioning exercise. Mm -hmm. And they think about what their life looks like at least five years from now, uh, assuming that they've done the things that they've spoken about in their strategic careers paper correctly. Um, and so, going off what you said before along that path what are some things that you might encourage them to be on the lookout for to know they may be in a place that could be the foundation of either a career or a calling yeah um it's a wonderful question and it's wonderful that you have them write this paper because i think um we're we're so often in life generally but also in educational institutions um, chronically focused just on like, what's the next thing? What's the next step? What's the next step in the major? What's the next step in terms of your first job or your next internship, as opposed to thinking about a much longer term vantage point. Um, and I think once those longer term vantage points come into focus better, um, it becomes possible to choose things differently and maybe a little more wisely, right? Than if it was just about the next step. 
So I think things to be on the lookout for as you think about, you know, could this be a place where you um, where you could build, you know, something that feels more like a career or like even a calling would be, uh, so I'm going to throw out a few and then I'm, I'm curious if there are others that you're thinking of that I should add. But, you know, I would think for one, um, is it is it a place where you feel that you as a person and the way that you think and the way that you kind of approach the world are are either anything from sort of tolerated to mm -hmm. accepted to celebrated, right? So it matters kind of what's the reception um, in this sort of environment. Um, I think that matters quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I also think it matters to, to focus a lot on what is the work sort of itself? And is the work going towards something that for you, you define as mattering in the world in some way. So even if, you know, let's say you're starting out at a more junior level and the work that you're doing isn't necessarily the most exciting stuff you've ever done, but that work is feeding up into something that you really care about. And you can see that with more experience and with more um, expertise, you know, as you go, that you'll be able to take on kind of more and more, you know, bigger and bigger, meatier and meatier things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a huge signal that this is maybe something worth um, investigating or sticking around for or exploring. Um, and then finally, I would say, to what extent does the path you're on or, you know, is the role you're in offering you opportunities to do something like job crafting, mm -hmm. like to, to make some customization sort of possible so that, you know, I'm, I'm being really abstract, but, you know, let's say you're working in sales and, um, you know, you're, you're really, you know, you, you like the sales work, you're sort of interested in the sales work, um, but what it is you find you're even more energized by is bringing on, you know, onboarding new employees mm -hmm. um, to learn about the organization, to learn about the product space or the service space. Um, to be getting them thinking about where is this market going, how do they get ready for that, and so on, um, to the extent that that's something that you really, you know, could imagine wanting to focus, you know, as much of your time on as possible. Um, if it's a place where there's latitude to sign up for as much of that as you want, where you could imagine someday, you know, that's how people who get into full-time trainer roles end up there. You know, they've often done the job. They realize that they actually liked sending people up for success in the job more than doing the job itself. But because they were so enthusiastic about it and good at it, you know, they can create roles for themselves in that space. So those are a few of the things that I'd be paying attention to. Right. And I've definitely, have definitely seen that even um, with some of the people that worked in career services at, at SOM. So like, yeah. uh, like Kristen Irish, she used to actually do finance until she, she seemed to like putting people in finance jobs better. So yeah, oh, exactly. a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, something that you, you, you know, said about that and something that, you know, I thought that I was on the lookout for is, is, is both sort of seeing like what you may be able to do in the future and whether the opportunities to do that. Um, but the thing for me is I think also, um, whether the things you have to do to get to that point are things that you're interested in. Yes. <laughs> so I know at least in one of my jobs, in order to uh, to level up, so to speak, I would have to do a lot more sales work. I would have had to, um, I would have to do less analytical work, mm -hmm. and, and I would have, you know, I would have, you know, moved up in the organization. But uh, none of that was appealing. And yes. So, and so, unfortunately, some of the aspects of being a credit analyst are still in my brain. I look for the <laughs> things that are are potential. <laughs> deal breakers. <laughs> yes. so, so whereas you look for the positive things to look for, I look for the things that might be challenges. <laughs> yes. I mean, to that point, I would say also, you know, um, is it, you know, is it the kind of thing where, where those less palatable periods of work, where it's taking you, if it's taking you to work that you know, you just can't wait to be able to do mm -hmm. it can sustain you through some period of time of that. But one of the things I find that people often under um, underweight or, you know, kind of under attend to is how, how do the people who are in the job that they think they are gunning for, right? Like that they're having to do a lot of sales to get to this next job. How happy do those people seem? 
Um, and what do their lives see, seem like? And, you know, if the answer to that is, wait a minute, you know, the prize at the end of the rainbow is, doesn't actually look like a prize now that I look at it, right? Yes. There's often a lot of information in that. And rather than just kind of, you know, gunning and striving and gunning and striving and not really thinking about what is it that you're doing to have to, you know, make that striving work, but to also pay attention to what happens if you succeed in that striving, I think is something that is always time well spent, to your point. Exactly. Uh, if you're a dog, what are you going to do when you've caught the car, so to speak? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And in our profession, uh, as you know, there's a joke that says, uh, you know, getting tenure in academia is a cake eating contest for which the reward is more cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I hope I continue to like cake. <laughs> I really hope you love cake. There's a lot of cake, as you'll see. You're already seeing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess, so keeping on with that uh, idea of th things uh, sort of being on the lookout for to keep in mind. So uh, a lot of students, uh, I have, now I have, now, I have a mix of students. Many of them are already working full time. Um, some of them are also uh, older and uh, finishing up their uh, degree. So they've been working for a while, but some of them are doing full time jobs for the first time. Um, and so uh, are the aspects of sort of job crafting more relevant for people that have been in their roles for a while? Or is it something that you should keep in mind even from, you know, day one of, of your job? Yeah, um, I think it's something you can keep in mind from day one. I think the more you know a job, you know kind of the bones and the guts of a job, the easier it is to understand where the degrees of freedom are in terms of what you could adjust, right? Because the longer you're around and the more you've done it, and the more you see what is it that your manager or supervisor or the company, the organization is paying attention to in terms of what they want to see out of your role. And where might you have some latitude that you could use to adjust various aspects of what it is you're doing or how it is you're doing it, um, that becomes easier. Okay. So we find that the longer people are in a job, the more they're crafting, which makes sense. But I will, you know, to kind of like throw a, um, you know, a hook to kind of the beginning of a, of your life in a job, I would say that early on in a job is kind of this golden period in which you can be asking questions and maybe pushing boundaries a little bit to say, oh, that's interesting that I have to spend, you know, the first two weeks of every quarter doing the following in this role. Why is it that we do it that way? Um, you know, you you get a pass, right, to ask right. these questions when you're new, and to say, well, you know, it seems to me it might work just as well if I tried mm -hmm. to do it this way, right? Like it's a window for maybe exploring um, where there might be opportunities to do things a little differently gotcha. um, that may be wor well worth exploring. Although I would pay attention to what are the normal, uh, rather the the local norms um, around how much of that seems to happen, right? So. Right. So a lot of it is use your, use your beginner's leeway to gain yes. lots of information about how things, how things are supposed to operate. And you start to see things that maybe you can, um, you can try to put yourself into as you move through the organization. Yes, absolutely. The other thing I would add to that is we, um, especially, you know, given the time right now with, uh, you know, the pandemic happening yeah. and many people are working in different modalities and formats than they may be used to, depending on what kind of work it is. Um, we know that the more people work off site from their sort of organizational, you know, setting, mm -hmm. um, the more likely they are to job craft, even if they don't oh. necessarily have, you know, the power of a managerial role or what have you. So there are opportunities in kind of being, um, you know, freed up from the strong context of what it means to be in the office or on site that I think is available to everybody, regardless of how long they've been with the organization. Right. So is that, I guess, follow-up question, is that a, a, both a, so you mentioned sort of being away from the strong context gives you a little bit of leeway. Is it also kind of a situation where in the pandemic with everybody working remotely, is that there are just more uh, edge conditions and problems that are coming up? So there's more opportunities for someone who's paying attention to try something new? I think so. Um, I think so. I think there's a liberation in realizing that, uh, you know, to, to solve challenges rather than ask the person, you know, in your bullpen or in your hall, along your hallway, who's the one who's most likely to know about the thing that you're facing, you're now kind of 
you're, you are really in a, in the true sense of it, sort of liberated to go to the best person in the firm or the best yeah. person in the division, right? To have this conversation with. And those kinds of conversations and ways of solving a problem or ways of, you know, taking advantage of an opportunity, I think are the stuff of, you know, what creates new ways of working and, you know, a new, newly adapted sort of designs of the job. Right. Sort of building, you build new capabilities in this space. Yeah. Okay. And that, um, yeah, and that kind of, you know, oddly enough, leads me into my next question. So um, uh, a big thing, and this, so this is on my mind for a few reasons. One is I'm writing a, writing a paper with, uh, with Jerry Davis about the resource-based view. Um, I told my students this, so they're gonna get tired of hearing about it. Um, <laughs> uh, but I teach them that too. And so the idea is that if you're an organization and you're trying to get profits that deviate from um, sort of the average for the industry, you need to have things about you that are very valuable, rare, and inimitable. Yes. Um, and from at least from a theoretical standpoint, those should allow you to sustain a competitive advantage over you know, or other people in the industry. Um, but the thing I try to tell my students, and I hope that they do in this paper, is to start thinking about this as being relevant to them as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that they can build up a set of resources and capabilities that are valuable, rare, and inimitable within their organizational context. And that may allow them to add new value. So, you know, and I think we've already kind of went in this direction, but might there be sort of an overlap there with the job crafting perspective that as an individual organization, you're able, if you're able to expand your resource base, you have more room to reshape the tasks and tasks and cognitive boundaries of your job and by extension, expanding your role. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great parallel. And I, I think it, it works really well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a strong, it's a strong level of analysis jump and it works, I think, because mm -hmm. if you think about people who are, who are able to see the opportunities for, you know, you can't job craft unless you see an opportunity to do it. Right. right? And so, you know, understanding kind of, you know, what are the opportunities here? Where might you have, you know, to use a sports analogy, like it's kind of like, where's the open space you can cut to, right? It's always yeah. about cutting to the open space. So like, can you identify where that open space might be, where you might be less monitored, where you might be, you know, things are not paid necessarily sort of such close attention to. So it's a chance to do a little improv or a little experimentation sort of in the role in a way that's likely to be low cost to you and potentially low cost to the organization, I think matters a lot. And I think also that um, if you pay attention to your opportunities for doing this, you know, we, we know this is from work that I've done with um, Jane Dutton at Michigan and Justin Berg. Um, who's now at Stanford, mm -hmm. people who, you know, even people new to the organization or at lower ranks in the organization, um, figure out how to do this, right? How to like find these opportunities. And it's often about sort of generating sort of trust or generating kind of buy-in, like, let me try this, like, let's just try this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you can engage in these experiments in crafting. Sometimes people do it under the radar entirely and just kind of make it happen anyway. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we, I have found, and I've never developed this into a paper, but the finding is really interesting, is when we ask people who are working, we define what job crafting is, we ask, have you ever done that? You know, they have or they haven't, mm -hmm. they describe what they did. And then when we ask them, this is just open-ended answer stuff, if we ask them what happened as a result of that, I was really surprised by the number of instances in which the answers had to do with, well, then they kind of made a whole group of, you know, XYZ around me, around <laughs> what I was doing, or I got promoted to a position where, you know, I like they realized this was really important or, you know, what have you. And the other thing, I have a paper um, that's in revision right now with Justin Berg um, and Adam Grant at Wharton and uh, some colleagues from Google, uh, which may or may not have been the organization in which the research I'm about to refer to was done. Maybe, um, <laughs> maybe you know, uh, you engage in internet search. Um, the uh, where we we did a, a quasi field experiment where we put people into random randomly assigned conditions and had them craft the jobs they were in, or craft their own skills and knowledge areas mm -hmm. to fit the job. So treating this the self as fixed versus the job as fixed. So and what we find is when people uh, when people crafted their jobs um, and made these kinds of investments, they were significantly more likely 
to move into a different role in the organization, either through promotion or through lateral moves. So, you know, in an organization like Google, for example, where it's easy for people to, it's, it's pretty well set up for people to be kind of fluid across roles or different right. offices, or, you know, there are a lot of, there, there's a lot of movement there. Um, what we found is that really kind of made that movement much more likely. Um, and I think that it has everything to do with your question. What is it that you realize you might actually be kind of suited for or more interested in, but then what does the organization have the opportunity to observe about you? from the crafting that you've done and the value that you've created from it. Right. So that's interesting. So it's, it's both sort of seeing an opportunity, but to a certain extent, uh, the, the, the crafting puts you in that space. You're almost, you're almost, you're almost making the hole. You're all, you're almost yeah. making that space to go fill. Yes, absolutely. It's certainly not space that was defined by the organization or by the manager. Yeah. Cool. All right. It reminds me, you use a sports metaphor and actually made me think of, of Wayne Gretzky, who says, you know, I, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going to be. Exactly. So. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I think that's exactly right. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I, it's such a good point. And I would say, another way to think about this, if, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, strategy and firm level stuff is that it's kind of a micro source of innovation, right? Like it's a way, huh. the way in which jobs evolve in organizations, right? If you didn't, if you never had a title of, you know, the head of blankety blank until somebody started doing blankety blank and you realize that's actually really valuable for us. We need that. This is really useful to us. Um, you know, that's not something that was a firm level imperative where you had a task force and they studied it and they added that job title. I know you know a lot about job titles and job descriptions, <laughs> um, you know, but it's, a, it's almost a form of organic development or evolution or growth, right? Both in an individual's career, but then also for the organization. That is, I had never thought of that. It makes it makes all sense in the world. That job crafting is effectively people innovation, right? yeah. rather rather than technical innovation. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> ah, so I'm I'm glad I'm doing this. I'm learning a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, next thing I wanted to ask you is, um, as I do whenever I interview anyone, I um you know I I stalk their web page for a bit and see what they're working on. And so you've got, you're working on a paper, you have a working paper entitled Remoteness as a Resource, the Impact of Virtual Work on Job Crafting. Now, I think we've kind of talked, maybe we've talked about things related to it, but uh, could you tell me a little bit about what, about this paper? Because I'm guessing, I'm betting a lot of the ideas probably resonate with us given where we are right now. Yes. Yeah. So I will, um, I've, I've kind of, I've, I've kind of given away the, the store in that mm -hmm. I, I mentioned it earlier, but it's yeah. the, the core finding of the paper. And it's a finding that's kind of in purgatory because I have this one finding from, uh, I think two field sites, but I need, I need more to sort of make it into an academic paper. Okay. Um, so it's just kind of like a sad, a sad draft, but the, uh, the, finding is, is that, that if, if you look at people who are managers versus non-managers in organizations, and you look at the degree to which they are remote from the organization and how they do their work, what you find is it doesn't matter how remote you are if you're a manager, they're engaging in just as much crafting. And we argue that that's because they have, in some sense, kind of the autonomy, the power, the permission, right, to take those kinds of liberties with their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, whereas people who are non-managerial, um, if they are on site kind of working, you know, in the organization, within the walls of the organization, they craft significantly less than non-managerial employees who are, are primarily working remotely. So you get this, you get the situation where you have, if you imagine four boxes, you know, mm -hmm. managers, remote, not workers, remote, not, mm -hmm. there's only one cell that's different from the other four. And that is non-managerial employees who are working on site craft significantly less than everybody else. And so, um, so that's the finding, mm. uh, and you know, I, I hope that it may inspire people who find themselves in strange working situations because of the pandemic in terms of how they're working or where they're working, um, to allow it also to be freeing um, in terms of thinking about different ways of you know tuning into what it is the organization needs, what it is that the organization has made you responsible for. And kind of within those boundaries, you know, I don't want to say anything goes, but, you know, maybe more goes than you would right. have thought in terms of, you know, better ways to do it, ways to do it that are more engaging to you, that more are reflective of how it is you want to experience that work or how you want to think about your identity right. um, in that work. So, yeah. 
makes a lot of sense. I mean, and right now you, it's, it's possible that you actually have a bit of licensing because, yes. you know, people, people are a bit more forgiving given the circumstances. You can, yeah, you can try things without as much fear of, I guess, of, of repercussions. Absolutely. It's, it's that the, um, the quote I love, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's trying things and asking for forgiveness mm -hmm. rather than asking for permission. It is a great way of, you know, seeing if a new way of doing something works or works better. It'll be, you know, I, it'll be interesting to sort of like see, because there's, there's a potential and hopefully sometime we'll be out of this, right? But you'll have, you might have these sort of cohort effects in yeah. firms because you'll have, you'll have these sort of one class of non-managerial people who were in the pandemic and who had this leeway. And then a few years down the road, you'll have, you'll have another class of non-managers who started in the firm and you yeah. can kind of sort of see if that, if, um, if that difference persists. Yes. Oh, I think that's a great, uh, that's a great design because you could imagine, um, for some reason, I'm thinking about research by, I think it's Jackson Liu at MIT and Adam. Oh, I've met Jackson. <laughs> yeah, where they show, they have a few papers now, I think, um, on this, that students who, if, if you just sort of travel abroad, doesn't really affect, you know, obviously that's a great experience, but mm -hmm. it's very different from living abroad, say for mm -hmm. a semester where you kind of have to navigate a town or a city and a language and a culture and, you know, utility bills or whatever, um, that just having had that experience makes people measurably more sort of creative, you know, cognitively complex, like able to kind of puzzle through, through things differently than people who have not had that experience. Now, mm -hmm. granted, the fault of that work, which is not their fault, is that you're not randomly assigning people, right? right. To, you know, you're going to live abroad for a term and you're not. And a lot of that has to do with opportunity. I always wanted to do a semester abroad when I was in college and that was just not in the, not in the stars. Right. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think similarly, what it is you've had to be kind of scrappy about and figure out as a result of working in the pandemic, uh, you know, ways of solving customer problems, ways of solving supply chain problems, ways of, improvising, you know, various solutions um, might, and, and for, this is going on for such a long time, and I fear we're only like halfway through it, if that, right? Yeah. And by the time you're through this, like, it's a chronic lens. It's not the travel abroad for a trip lens, it's the like live there lens, right? Yeah. And so, you know, could that have a marked and measurable effect on how those managers manage going forward? And also their, their openness to just innovation anyway, right? To, to me, the, one of the fascinating things about this pandemic is for people who are able to work remotely, which I don't want to ignore the huge swath of people in the world yeah. whose work has not changed at all as a result right. of that, because it was not sit with a laptop kind of work and it, and it never was. Um, I do think a lot about organizations and managers who, who actively resisted having people work remotely because they felt sure that the work wouldn't get done, that this isn't work that could be done this way. And suddenly when it's forced, as it has been um, for so many organizations and jobs, the test case has been made and proven right. for what right. is and isn't transferable, right? So it's not everything that's transferable, um, you know, that's clear. Like we see kind of what breaks down when we're not together, but, um, but I think it will be harder to, I would imagine that those same managers would be hard pressed to be able to come up with the motivation or the argument to go back to sort of insisting on things being in person and so on in the same way that they might have before. And my hope would be they'd be more flexible and experimental in what they're willing to try around all of their management practices. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think to a certain extent they're gonna be almost forced to. I think you're gonna have, uh, you're, they're, you see there's some variation amongst employees. There's going to be some of the employees uh, will say if at the, at the higher end that will probably demand that now that yeah. it's clear that it can be done. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, there'll be people who demand it, but the, the anticipation that people are going to demand it all the time, I think we're now seeing the limits of that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I think that, I, I think people don't want to be completely away from the office all the time anymore is my sense. I think right. we're starting to see how much people really do need. We are a social species, like we need to be together. And I think it's some mix as opposed to, you know, people will want to be in the office all the time or be home all the time. That's very true. And 
again, this is a, ends up being a great transition um, because the next thing I wanted to ask is uh, how do you, and this is, might be hard, but how do you think the pandemic will, or to what extent do you think the pandemic will have lasting effects on people's ability to find uh, meaning in their, their work and their career? So um, what I'm thinking about, and this, this is literally to what you just said, is that there are some things about the pandemic that have changed jobs permanently. So yeah. for example, as, as a professor, like I can't imagine a world in which being a professor looks exactly how it did like in 2017, for example, like it's going to just look different. There's going to be more expectations of remote teaching. And um, yeah. as someone that has a good amount of shtick in the classroom um, that doesn't transfer <laughs> over to, <laughs> over to remote, like this might be a bit challenging. And so yeah. I'm just wondering to what extent do you think like, like that's going to sort of, change how people, if they can find meaning in work? Um, that's a really good question. It's a hard question. It's a hard question. I mean, I, and there's like the micro question and the macro question in that question, right? Mm -hmm. So in the, like what I hear in what you're saying is sort of the more micro question, which is, okay. you know, as the formats of work or the expectations or the, you know, um, I don't know, kind of the channels in which the work can happen or, or now does happen or is expected to happen. As those things change, um, how might it change the meaning of the work for people? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll answer that question first, but there's also a more macro sort of um, take on this that I have too. But on the micro side, what I would say is the following that, um, and I'm going to draw on a, I'm working on a paper right now with a doc, well, not a doctoral student, now a junior faculty member who, um, of, who I've worked with, who were studying disappearing occupations. Okay. Right? So we know a lot about job loss. We know a lot about, you know, what happens when a firm downsizes, what happens when, you know, there are labor market shocks and so on. But we know less about when, what happens when the whole occupation is disappearing. Right. Um, meaning, and when what we're studying in this paper is um, newspaper journalists because it's a it's a it is a significantly shrinking shrinking occupation in the yes, u.s and um and so what we find is relevant to your question which is the following if you if you dig really deep with these people who do this work what you find is they really define the work of newspaper journalism as being about sort of the tasks of the work like the writing the you know the interviewing like all this kind of stuff there's the uh, relational sort of part, which has mm -hmm. to do with, you know, their relationship with the public, with their colleagues and so on, is a huge piece of this for them. And then the impact of that work right. um, on society, on the world, you know, on elections, on, you know, whatever it might be. And what we find is for people who have been downsized out of newsrooms um, and are trying to figure out like what's next, the ability to take one piece of that, like, okay, well, writing is a big piece of journalism. Mm -hmm. I can write in this other occupation. And so I'll take that well-honed skill and use it there. They're never as happy as they were as newspaper journalists, but they, right. you know, feel like, well, there's something to this. Or, you know, the advocacy piece of it. I can do okay. advocacy work in any number of ways, but they're not doing the writing and they're not doing the, you know, same kind of impact. And it's not the same kind of camaraderie of a newsroom and so on. So they've let go of all that, but they've been able to kind of compartmentalize and pull an aspect of that work. Gotcha. And with that successfully kind of transition. The people who are relevant to your question who I worry about are the people who see all of these features or elements as fused. Like you, like if you take one yes. out, the whole thing falls apart. It's a house of cards. None of it means anything. The card you're holding isn't worth anything because the house is gone. Mm -hmm. And so they are the ones who really, who do things like try to live off, you know, whatever retirement funds they might have, try to freelance, right? And it's not a matter of do they have means or do they have a working spouse? Like this is, this, this is really about how do they see the relationship between the elements of the work more so than like their own personal situation. And so to your question about like, things are gonna shift, you know, like if, if being a professor used to mean being with students, being in the classroom for this like co-creation experience of learning and dialogue and insight, and now it's, you know, you're delivering a commodity product over Zoom and they don't even care if you're there or not, just tape it and, you know, 
we'll find out later, did they get the content, right? Like right. That's, I'm saying that in an extreme way, but there are ways, right? But you know, yeah. but there are ways that you can change this or any work in a way that is so violating of the thing that made it meaningful for people that it's no longer tenable for them to do. So I worry about that a lot for, mm -hmm. for work that, for either economic reasons, and there's reason for higher education to worry about that, uh, or for this reasons of efficiency get reshaped, but in the reshaping completely uh, lose their meaning for many of the incumbents of those jobs. Um, on, on the macro side, what I was gonna say is, so I um, was on the faculty at NYU when 9-11 happened yes. and lived a mile from ground zero. And that experience uh, for all of us, you know, in, in the world, in the US, you know, in particular, um, at the time led to a really interesting shock that I think the pandemic has, at, at least the early months of the pandemic felt like a similar shock, obviously very different, but mm -hmm. similar in this way. When 9-11 happened, there was a major reckoning with what am I doing? Is the meaning of the work I'm doing, like, does it even matter, like, to the world? Like, is, is what I'm doing sort of significant in any, you know, cosmic sense? And so what you saw were ads in the subways, um, news stories about people who had been kind of, you know, working with spreadsheets on Wall Street and, you know, what have you, deciding, you know what, I'm, I'm getting out. And so people right. went into teaching, they went into, um, you know, police work, they went into the military, they went into helping professions, caring professions, um, because they felt like this was a moment of accounting. It's a mortality sort of salience shock of like, oh my goodness, you know, the world is not what I thought it was. What am I doing in it? That, that really shifted sort of, not everybody's, right, but a lot of people's um, career paths and, and, you know, to the point of getting out of one career and going into another. What I think, I think a similar thing has happened with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think it's fading now, maybe not, I don't know, but um, where, you know, suddenly the whole world is, you know, potentially in danger. We didn't know so much at the beginning. And so, you know, what is your thing that you're doing for pay? Is it, does it matter? Is it, does it matter to you? Um, the thing I worry a lot about is unlike in 9-11, the pandemic is happening in the midst of an accompanying you know, economic meltdown, right? Yes. That will continue to be a slow rolling economic disaster globally for maybe generations to come. It's, it's early to say, and I hate to sound so, you know, doom and gloom, but, but it's true. So, so it could be this, you know, increased salience of, wait a minute, now that I really look at it, I don't think this really matters, um, but I can't get out of it because there's not enough economic security to switch. And there's not, you know, there aren't options because everybody's kind of holding on jobs yeah. um, that that can create, I think, a lot of difficulty for people. Um, but these kinds of events, I think, are accelerators for, um, you know, reckoning with what is it that you're doing? And, you know, those have two major domains. One is work. Um, and then the other is kind of your personal life. So we know 9-11 and the pandemic have both been accelerants of people getting together and getting engaged or getting married um, or people making the decision that maybe this isn't, you know, the relationship to be in. And so um, it's, these are sort of cosmic events in that sense. Wow. Yeah. So um, I think on the macro, sort of the macro idea, it reminds me a lot of uh, uh, Kathy Sutcliffe's uh, research about how disruption tends to drive sense making as your patterns of understanding are messed up you try to then sort of re, uh, make sense of unfolding events so yeah right yeah. and yeah. i hadn't thought and i hadn't thought about that sort of the the idea of and this is this is i know it's going to be important for my students is the idea of a of a of a of a of people seeing a job as containing tasks meaning and impact and some people viewing it as a job having all of those things together and they're, they're not separable. Right. And so um, if your job goes away, you don't just lose the task, you lose everything. Yeah. It'd be hard to figure out sort of what to do afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, so got to, I don't want to, I, I still have a few more questions, but I don't want to take up too much time. So I, uh, I think that I will um, ask, ask this next one to sort it together. Okay. Um, and uh, 
So one of the things that, you know, comes up when you're thinking about careers is uh, what's motivating you for doing it. And so what, you know, we're just talking about is how um, disruption can potentially alter your motivation for pursuing a particular path. Um, but, but that aside, you know, people sometimes go into a particular job for instrumental reasons or, you know, things you want. So like I, I was a finance guy for the longest time. And part of that was, you know, instrumental, you know, yes. finance pays well. And, um, yeah. But sometimes people go into jobs because it both pays well, but there's some sort of internal motivations and um, like there's meaning and purpose in the work. And you, in your 2014 uh, proceedings paper, you found out that there's a potentially a long-term problem in yeah. um, trying to hold multiple motivations for work. So can you just yeah. mention that, a little bit about that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and this is a puzzle I'm continuing to work on. Okay. The problem of incentives mm -hmm. uh, is kind of how I'm thinking about it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to start out just by saying, because I want to be really clear, that yes. I don't want to say that instrumental reasons for doing something are bad. Nope. Um, right? That there may be any number of reasons to do something for instrumental reasons. And so sure. I'm not I'm not judging the source or the type of motive so much as I am interested in what is the relationship of these different kinds of motives to each other and to outcomes that people experience. And so um, this paper started with uh, a conversation with Barry Schwartz, who is one of my co-authors on the paper um, about the Marines. Mm -hmm. Is this okay if I tell the story? <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so <laughs> we, were, we were curious about, it. The time used to be when the, the recruiting poster for the Marines was this really striking image of a Marine in you know, full dress uniform, um, looking very stern mm -hmm. um and at the bottom it said um the few the proud the marines and yep. that was it that was all they needed and you know if that spoke to you you were going to be a marine or you were going to try to become a marine mm -hmm. and over the years we noticed that you started to see like you know join whether it was the marines or the military you know join the military see the world join the military get tuition for your education join the military mm -hmm. learn a trade join the military great career preparation, join the, yes. right, so all kinds of different levers, if you will, of motivation or types mm -hmm. of motivations were getting kind of tapped. Um, and our observation was, huh, we bet this is getting more people to go into the military, um, but is it getting the people into the military that the military most wants? And this puzzle, right, of why, you know, does it matter why you're there? And how can we understand that better is what led to this study. So we tried to study the Marines, didn't work. We didn't know anybody who had enough sort of clout or leverage to get us access. Right. Uh, but then uh, we had, by chance, someone doing a sabbatical came to Yale. Uh, he was the head of behavioral sciences and leadership at West Point. Mm -hmm. um, I was telling him about our attempts to do this study with the level of competition between the branches of the armed services being what they are, he scoffed and said, why are you messing with the Marines? I could get you the army. And so that started a, let me think, a seven year process to get data out of West Point because they study all kinds of things about all the incoming cadets, including why they're there, but not in an admissions way, right? Because everybody would say the same thing. I'm here because of honor, duty, country. It's after they get there. And so you're in, you're safe. You can tell the truth <laughs> that they survey people about, you know, are you here because this would be instrumentally, right? This is a way to make a better living later on. People who go, go through West Point, who make it through West Point and make it through the five years of um, service you have to do after your four years at West Point. So it's a nine year commitment. <laughs> those people, if they don't stay in the military, are often set up for really great careers because they've gotten a very good education yep. and they've led serious things, right, as a military officer. And so, you know, corporations, companies really, you know, are very attracted to them. So you can make a very nice life out of that. Um, so that's, you know, the, so there are reasons like that that people go and there are reasons that people go that have to do with, you know, honor, duty, country. This feels like a moral duty, right? You know, this is what I want to be a member of the United States military. I want to serve sort of in this way. It's not about what will come of it. It's not about what kinds of pay or promotion sort of side effects it throws off. You know, those will happen, but my focus is on, you know, doing the thing. And we we wanted to look at these two motivations um, and what their impact was, but we also realized it's not like, it's not like a blood type, right? Like you can have both kinds of motivations, right? Like you can have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And so what we found was if you measure these motivations 
upon entry, like when they get to West Point, they're already in, and you control for everything under the sun that we can, um, mm. their background, their socioeconomic status, their GPA, their SAT scores, all of this stuff. Uh, they're in their uh, race, gender, um, you know, where, where in the country they're from and so on, controlling for all of these things. What we find is the stronger your internal motives for being there, you know, that you want to be doing the thing that is the focus and purpose of the institution itself, um, this helps in your ability to make it through West Point. They have a pretty high attrition rate. It's a tough institution. Yeah. Um, it improves what is going to happen um, to you in your mandatory five years of service in terms of how likely you are to be flagged for early promotion, meaning you're identified as being an elite officer. Um, and it's better for you from the point of view of how long you stay after your five years of mandatory service. Mm -hmm. So we tracked people into 14 years after we measured this initial set of motives wow. and okay. find that it has a significant impact. Having strong instrumental motivation or strong instrumental motives ends up sort of lessening or reducing the positive effect of these internal motives for for each one of these outcomes the form that relationship takes is different across the different outcomes but mm -hmm. suffice it to say that when you hold these mixed motivations um it diffuses the effect it lessens the positive impact of the internal motives that you hold because you're also holding these instrumental motives. Um, and, you know, that feels like news, right? Because if you think about, you know, for your students, for us, anything you do, right? If you're a student and you work really hard and you study really hard and you take this really seriously, you're also gonna get good grades, right? You're also gonna maybe get more options in your career, what have you. You may be studying that hard because you really care about the material and you really want to learn the material. These other things are happening too, right? These more instrumental things, right? So there's a big difference between somebody who studies absolutely everything really hard because they want to learn it versus mm -hmm. somebody who wants to get an A. And they're, yep. they really don't care if they learn it. They want to know enough to you know, be able to get the A. Um, and that makes all the difference, I think, mm -hmm. in terms of what you know, the level of people's motivation and kind of how they're able to sustain that motivation, what it is that's kind of, you know, igniting that motivation um, ends up being really important. And I think it's important because, and then I'll, I'll I will get off my soapbox about this, because we live in a world <laughs> where I feel very much like, and Barry and I are working on this right now, we live in a world where government, education, healthcare, workplaces for sure, um, are increasingly governed by, uh, and this is not just this administration or, you know, I'm not talking, this is not an administration story. This is like over the last set of decades. They're inc we're increasingly governed or managed by systems that set as an assumption that the only reason that anybody would do anything is because there's some incentive to do it. There's right. some instrumental reason to do it, right? So we do things like, you know, if, if the kids read 10 books in their second grade class, they'll get a pizza party, right? So on the one hand, that's very well-meaning. You want kids to read, right? I mean, the 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 um, motive behind that goal, or you know, the the hope behind that, you know, system is a is a good one. It's a pure mm -hmm. one. I don't fault people for wanting kids to read more. The issue is if you teach them that you read because you have an incentive to do it that comes in the form of like greasy, cheesy deliciousness. <laughs> um, what you find is when you withdraw that reward, kids are less likely to read than they were before you introduced it, right? And that to get the reward, they read books that are shorter, simpler, you know, like they're about, it's about getting to the goal. It's an instrumental thing. You've turned something that you wanted to make an internal, you know, um, intrinsic, you know, you read for the joy of reading. You were trying to instill that in kids. And because of the way that you sort of set it up as an instrumental thing, um, you know, you've kind of interrupted that process. And so that that's something I puzzle a lot about and care a lot about and I'm starting to write more about. Because right, uh, figuring out, I mean, because I'm not going to be able to undo those systems overnight. So the question is, what might you be able to do as an intervention or something to counteract that sort of right. that instrumentality? And it's it's funny that you mentioned that pizza thing, because that was me, me as a kid. Like, I, I mean, I, I read all the time. So I had these little slips for free pizzas coming out of my ears. And I didn't <laughs> use most of them because I just love to read. See, um, so there just, you go. <laughs> Just, there you I, go. I nearly busted out laughing when you said that thing. It was called Book It. Pizza Hut used to do it. You yep. read books and they give you a little, you get a free thing for a free medium pan, small pan pizza. 
I had like a hundred of those things, but. <laughs> I remember that program and, <laughs> and exactly. I mean, there's, there's the proof, right? There's the proof. So, um, you know, did you, were you the 10th the book or however many it was, were you like asking, can we go, can we go? Yeah. Like I have the next pizza. Um, Barry Schwartz, my co-author in this work, uh, once in, and so I'm going to say, I'm going to get, I'm going to get myself into trouble and I'm going to get you into trouble, Teddy. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, once, because he was very curious about this, like, is it about the learning? Is it about the grades? He was really puzzling over these questions of motivation. Mm -hmm. On the first day of the first semester of a class he was teaching at his college, said to the students, well, the grades are in. I've turned them in today. It's done. Everybody got a good grade it's over. So now we can just get down to the business of learning. And it was essentially an experiment to see what would happen if Holy there were no implications for like, was it a great paper? Did you really finish the reading? Right. If, if all of these people who were there, who with many of them with stars in their eyes said, yes, I am here because I really, I care about this. It was an elective. I care about this material. I want to learn about this and so on. Um, and he was just curious to see sort of what would happen without this kind of instrumental outcome of the grade over them. And, you know, some of them, um, stuck it out and, you know, came to every class and so on. He said some of them he never saw again. Uh, and some of them really tried to sort of stick with it. But as the semester wore on and other work piled up and, you know, it was mm. the thing that people kind of dropped because they knew, you know, there wasn't this, this, you know, stick or carrot or, you know, whatever any right. longer. And I think that I would imagine that the students in that instance learned more about, their own relationship to their motivations and motives than they ever could have otherwise, because yeah. he recounted having really deep conversations with them about what they thought their reaction was going to be in terms of how they would conduct themselves over the semester and what they learned about the nature of motivation from what actually did happen. Wow. Anyway, That's don't a ask. Hell of a lesson. <laughs> it is a hell of a lesson. Don't ask Professor <laughs> DeWitt to turn in your grades right now, but you know, I broached the top. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh wow well i mean that so that that's it's that's it for the questions i just didn't know if there's any any uh sort of uh last thing you would have any piece of advice that you want my students to keep in mind that we haven't already talked about because we've uh you know hit on uh, several topics so i uh so i i now that i'm kind of you know um speaking off not off the cuff at all but you know um, being a little looser in the kinds of things I'm willing to disclose and get you in trouble by asking you to turn in your students' grades. Um, I will say, and, th and this is early because the paper's not done yet. Uh, the analyses are done, but the paper's not done. Um, together with another colleague you know well, Jim Barron, um, we are working on a paper that looks at, and, and there's advice to your students in this, we are looking at what it is that predicts people feeling highly satisfied, like the highest category you can answer on the scale, highly satisfied with their work for the entirety of their career. So these are people who were followed from the time they were in high school until they were in their 70s. Oh, wow. And we, you can control for everything under the sun in terms of what else might shape, you know, people's satisfaction with their work and so on. And what we find um, is that in a nutshell, people who think about work as being more about helping other people in some way than they do about thinking than they do uh, thinking about work as a way to you know make money or you know kind of material gain. Um, controlling for everything else, social class, opportunity, ultimate level of education, the kind of work people do, the kind of personality they have, what happens in their personal lives, and so on. What we find is that explains a lot of variance in who starts out really satisfied in whatever kind of work they're doing wow. and how satisfied they are for the entire rest of their career. So I, if I had parting advice, maybe it would be to think about as you evaluate jobs, as you evaluate paths, as you evaluate um, opportunities, and this is going to be very personal to you, if it's an opportunity where you feel like, you know, I can help the world in some way, or like it, it, I can be helpful to people in some way, even if other people don't see it as a helpful type of job or work or what have you, if you do, that's all that matters. And mm -hmm. that may end up being more consequential than you might realize at this point for what your experience of that work will be. Wow. So we are, we are social and helping out our, our fellow humans matters to us over the long run. Yeah. 
and it can be as as you know local as your coworkers, right? Or you know people who are in in that work with you. Uh, it could be the your clients, your customers, your ultimate beneficiaries. I don't know that it matters kind of who it is you think you're helping, but if you see this activity as being about contributions to other people, it turns out this really matters a lot. Wow. And Mr. Rogers always said, look for the helper. So that. <laughs> <laughs> Sage advice. Sage advice. Well, oh, Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This has been helpful for me. It's given me some things that I want to write about now, but I, I hope that as my students watch this and as you all work on your strategic careers papers, that you can take a lot of these, uh, insanely wise words and put them together with, um, with the things that you come up with. And I look forward to reading your papers. Thank you so much so, for having me. You, it was really fun to talk with you. Oh, thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye. Take Bye. care. Mm -hmm.